All right, everybody, good evening. Welcome to the Wars 1 and 8 Neighborhood Planning Assembly, or NPA meeting. Um, if you haven't signed in, uh, if you would be uh, at some point, that we'd appreciate that so we have your contact information. Um, I'm Cindy Cook. I'm one of the steering committee members. We're going to do um, w um, uh, introductions around the room. If you, I'd ask you to say who you are, where you live, and we want to move quickly so we can keep going, but we also just want everybody to know who else they're dealing with in the room. So again, I'm Cindy Cook. I live on East Avenue, and I'm on the steering committee of the Ward 1 NPA. Karen Long, I live on Henry Street, and I'm also on the steering committee. Oh, you guys? Okay. Yeah. I'm Angie Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street. Uh, Martha Lang and I uh, live next to the Iround School Building. Tony Reddington, Ward 2, uh, invite you tomorrow night uh, for Ward 2-3 to have a repeat performance. Uh, Sophie Quest, Old East End Neighborhood Coalition, Ward 1. Hi, I'm Jack Hansen. I'm the East District City Councilor. I live on Pearl Street in Ward 1. Hi, I'm Sharon Busher. I'm the Ward 1 City Councilor, and I live on East Avenue. I'm Sandy Barrett, and I live on Loomis Street. I'm Mark Porter from Brooks Avenue. Uh, Richard Hilliard, in sympathy with the Kurds. Michael Long, I live on Henry Street. Captain Jamie Value, Burlington Fire Department. Linda Sheehy, Mansfield Avenue. Camden Munn, firefighter on Burlington. Thanks. Kaylee Haberstrow, UVM Student Government. Uh, Jack Fannin, UVM Student Government. Sally Short, UVM Student Government. Aiden May. UVM Student Government. Thanks, you guys. Mark Hughes, Ward 1. Jeffrey Glassberg, resident of Waltham, Vermont. Test your geography and a guest tonight. <laughs> Grace Vecito, Ward 2. Hannah King, Ward 8. Dan Daniel, Ward uh, 1. Charles Winkleman, Ward 1. Christy Delphia, Ward 1. Jason Stuffel, Colchester Ave, Ward 1, and Old East End Neighbors. Dave Colley, Nash, Nash Place, Ward 1. Patricia Seelan, Nash Place, Ward 1. Tom Darenthal, Ward, Ward 1, Nash Place. Nancy Kirby, Ward 1, Colchester Avenue, next to the cemetery. <laughs> Fletcher Pratt, uh, Riverside Ave, Ward 8. Carol Livingston, Calarco Court, um, also on the steering committee for Ward 1 and 8. Uh, Brian Sewell, Loomis Street, Ward 1. Jonathan Chapel, Sokol, Ward 1, and on the steering committee. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lisa Kingsbury. I'm with UVM Campus Planning Services. Great. Did we miss anybody that came in as we were proceeding? Oh, Cyril. The man behind the camera here. Cyril Flash, uh, East Avenue. So welcome, everybody. I'm gonna, my job is to keep things moving, um, and, but also um, ensure that we have as, as good and rich a conversation as we can. So it's a bit of a challenge tonight, because we have a lot going on. So we're going to just jump right in to uh, speak out. Oh, no, actually, we want to talk. We, first, we want to get some questions. The, uh, pres the new president of UVM is coming to the next meeting in November. And so I think, Jonathan, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I want to speak very quickly about a couple of things. Um, first of all, you, hopefully you'll find in front of you a, uh, a survey that we'd like you to fill out. If it's too much to do during the, the, the slow points in tonight's meeting, take it home and contact any of the steering committee members, and we can come pick it up. Um, but what, what we want to do is we want to try to make as productive a visit as possible when, when, the, um, when the new president, the UV, new UVM president comes. And so what, what we tried to consider was what are the issues and what are the conversations that we'd like to start having to make the most constructive relationship we can with the university. The university sits in the city, 
but the university also sits in Ward 1. And so we are uh, the Ward 1 folks, and 8, thank you, Wards 1 and 8. And uh, so we are really the, the um, we house the university, as it were, and what, what we can do with the university, what the university can do with us, um, will make for a better relationship for us and for the city. So you'll find in front of you a survey. It's, qu it's questions to kind of whet your appetite or whet your thinking about what you might, might want to ask. Um, what we want to do is, is compile and consolidate this sort of thing and, and send it to the, to the president before the meeting so that he kind of has an idea of the things that matter most to us. Um, so if you can fill this out, that would be great. The other thing I, would, I want to talk about is something we talked about last, last month, and that is how to spend the extra money that we've received from the city, that the NPAs received from the city. And we actually handed out last month some, some index cards and asked everybody to put down some ideas. Going through those ideas were fantastic. Going through those ideas made the steering committee realize that we didn't quite understand all the details of what we can spend money on and what we can't spend money on. And so uh, what you will probably find in front of you also is a list of the, basically the ways that we can, thank you, um, basically the ways we can spend money. Um, and we are going to take the suggestions that we got last month and we're going to take any other suggestions you may have, but not tonight, unless you want to talk about it during speak out, um, but not right now. And we're going to go put together something like a proposed budget that we will bring back to the, to the wards, uh, to the NPA. The important thing to note is that Ward 1 gets funding from the city and Ward 8 gets funding from the city. And it's, it's, it's really separate budgets. Um, and so we're thinking that because Ward 1 already has a uh, rather extensive steering committee, um, we'd probably take the, take the lead on consolidating the input that we've gotten and bring something back. Anybody else in, the, in Ward 1 who is interested in participating should just let us know. This isn't a closed discussion or anything, it's just for simplicity. Ward, ward 8, on the other hand, is it, we don't have very many steering committee members on Ward 8. So what I want to do is I want to hand out a, um, a sign-up sheet and any member of Ward 8 who is interested in working on this should put their name and coordinates down on it so that we can get in touch with you. Linda Risby would be kind of uh, chairing that committee as it were, at least organizing the meeting or the meetings, um, and she would like some help with that. So I want to just pass this around, and anybody from Ward 8, if they can, um, if they're interested, please put your name down. And with that, I hope I'm, I haven't run out of time. Great. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Oh, so I forgot to do something very important, which is this. <laughs> Whoops. You it's gotta not hold on. To it. Ah, okay. Ah, there's swag over there. In any case, uh, it was from the Schmanska Park um, uh, celebration. There we go. So there's, it's a bunch of uh, bike stuff. There's a thing that you can put on the back of your bike with a flashing light and uh, um, a whistle light, all kinds of fancy stuff. So uh, it would be great if it went away to good homes by the end of the evening. So this is now the point where we call speak out. And uh, that's an opportunity for people to say briefly to make announcements about events that they think that uh, others in the community will be interested in, or concerns that they think that this body should take up at another time. So let me just get a sense of how many people are interested in speaking out and speak out. Four or five-ish, probably more as um, things come out. We have 15 minutes. So if you could keep your comments to a couple of minutes, that would be ideal. And I'm just going to go kind of geographically in order, if that's OK. Yeah. Uh, two things very, very briefly. Jason Williams is not here, but I would urge the reconstitution of the um, uh, neighborhood parking and traffic uh, task force with UVM. I don't think it was ever disbanded, but it's just defaulted, and I would think that that, that had some value that's been seen. Uh, the lack of it has been seen in some of the things that happen around the campus. The second thing is that on the 23rd, I think it was, of September, um, the City Council um, voted, as I understand it, to renew the 2009 Memorandum of Understanding with UVM. Uh, and I'd just like to know from our city councillors what's on it. 
because uh, previously we've been told it's been confidential. Would you use your time later? My name is Sandy Baird and I live on Loomis Street and I've probably lived on Loomis Street longer than anybody has lived in this ward at this point maybe. I've lived on Loomis Street since 1973 um, in a continuous fashion. Um, and I uh, am a lawyer also. I wanted to come tonight especially to talk about two things. As I walk around the city, I see that the city, in my view, is in really a total mess. Um, and I wanted to mention that because of that, I think because we have such serious problems, especially in terms of homeless people, that I have tried to found a new Burlington College, but only in small ways. I was a faculty member at Burlington College for many, many years. Um, and um, now, now that it has collapsed in a fin financial crisis, I would like to start a new little think tank called Burlington College's original name was Vicki, the Vermont Institute of Community Involvement. I would like to restart that Vermont uh, Institute of Community and International Involvement because I've been very involved in projects in Cuba. So I would like to restart that as a little think tank. I don't have time in my life to have uh, start an accredited college, but I do have time to start a think tank, and I brought some announcements of the first kinds of discussions we were going to have. The location of that is on 20 Allen Street, the old uh, North End Community Center, the, and I'm going to pass out the first kinds of community discussions that we'll be holding every other Wednesday night. We've discussed, we've had two discussions, one on the sale of Burlington uh, Telecom, the second on the big hole in the middle of Burlington, and this Wednesday night on the, 20, on the uh, 16th, we're going to have a community discussion about political solutions to some of those problems, and we're inviting to speak about that, the Coalition of Livable Cities. I wish you would all come. Thank you. Thank you. Others that want to speak? Yes. Uh, I hope you were all watching the wonderful pictures of the September 13th party that we had at Chemanska Park on, uh, yeah, September 13th. So um, that, that wonderful building, Sharon has just been telling us all of the wonderful things that used to happen there, including having these meetings. And so I hope you'll all support us in trying to get the money, some money maybe from uh, NPA just support us in trying to make that open again because the Parks and Rec says, oh, maybe in a few years it might be open again. It's a wonderful building and we really need to be using it. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah King and I'm a Ward 8 resident. I just wanted to let you all know I will be running for the steering committee at next meeting. So I look forward to letting you all know what I hope to do and if you have any questions, please reach out. Did you bring any campaign swag or no? No. Okay. Um, anybody else? Oh, sorry. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Hughes. <clears throat> I wanted to first give a shout out to Tony Reddington uh, just for the hard work that you've been doing over there in the um, in the Maple uh, King Street area. I really appreciate that, and I'm sure you'll probably say a few words about it. Uh, so I, I just want to thank you, Tony. Thank you for your work over there. <clears throat> the other thing is, is I'm, I'm with, I'm the executive director of Justice for All, and uh, we're doing a, a number of things. We have a really huge uh, uh, initiative underway, uh, this, this Q4 initiative uh, uh, around our, um, we call Change Vermont uh, legislative agenda. But um, we're continuing to do those, um, those film viewings as well as those, um, the, we call them game on. Uh, it's just to get, get the community out. It's a place where you can just bring out your board games. So they are uh, going to be on the uh, second and fourth uh, Sundays from uh, th from three to six p.m. That's at the uh, the First Congregational Church at 38 South Winooski Street. We do that uh, every other well the second and the fourth Sundays. This upcoming Sunday we'll be uh, viewing uh, Fruitvale Station. Uh, oh, a month from there will they'll be the 13th, and a month from there. Uh, the film 13th, and then finally at the end, I think we'll be doing um, the Hate You Give. So that those are the uh, film viewings for uh, the next three months, and then the opposite Sundays on the on the fourth Sundays would be the games. I also wanted to invite everyone in the room to our um, Justice for All's fifth birthday party, which is at uh, the North End uh, Studio A. Uh, that's going to be on the 19th 
uh, just make a note of that. And just you can just go out for details on this and anything else that we're doing. Hey, Ernard, how are you? Um, and you just go to justiceforallvt.org. That's justiceforallvt.org. And you can see um, some of those things. And I'll leave some breadcrumbs over to the Racial Justice Alliance's website for all of the other activities that are happening for the up and through the, through the close of the year. Thank you. Yeah, Jason. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone who came out to the party at Schmanska Park. Uh, we think we had about 125 people. We know we had like 90 people in the one photo. Uh, a bunch of people who lived in the neighborhood came out uh, and a bunch of people who used to live in the neighborhood came out and told us some stories about it. Um, the barn was open. I just wanted to reiterate, uh, people got to look around inside and see how nice it is. Uh, if you'd like to see that open, please contact Cindy White at the Department of Parks and Rec uh, and let her know how much you want to use that. It's a great asset to our community. Uh, and it was really nice just to see a wide variety of people out having a good time. And the weather uh, was great, as you can see from the photos beforehand. Uh, we plan to make it an annual thing. So uh, just wanted to mention that. Thanks a lot. Anybody else? Karen, could you use some cardboard? I just wanted to ask the crowd how they feel. We had the police officer come last time and he told us about that they were um, cutting down on enforcements. So stop signs, speeding, um, they were, I don't know, he showed us these graphs. I don't know if people remember, but he was basically saying that, you know, they're trying to have a, maybe a better image of them and not be the bad guy, or that was the way I took it. So I have been trying to meet with him personally, but I am upset because in my neighborhood there was a party with more than 100 students that were herded out because they had a noise viol, you know, people called the police. And one person on the lease was given a ticket whereas the ordinance reads everybody in, you know, on the lease is supposed to get a ticket. I think it's another way to you know, maybe be a little more gentle. Um, I'm upset about that. I really don't like speeding cars and I don't like people running red lights or stop signs in Burlington. So I don't know, we need to get, maybe everyone else does, but either way we need to get a message out to the police about it. Where was the party? Weston, 12 Weston. Yep, exactly. Okay. So anybody else first speak out? Okay, we're gonna keep moving right along because we have a lot to cover tonight. So Tony Reddington is gonna speak about the Champlain Parkway. So take it away, Tony. Oh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, first, I wanna say a, a good word for the work that uh, Sandy Barrett has been doing with Vicki. I've attended both of the seminars so far and they've both been enlightening. I, I can't, uh, w uh, one of them is online already on Channel 17, the first one on Burlington Telecom. And the second one on the hole in the ground uh, uh, is certainly there's a, going to be a transcript at some point. Also to the uh, efforts of uh, the Tenants Union, which is our, our new kids on the block, uh, needed for a long time and the, the great work they're doing. Um, I sp uh, in talking about the parkway, which basically goes uh, from Main Street uh, to uh, the South Burlington border, uh, southward on Pine and then uh, a new, uh, a, a new uh, route, um, I spent a decade, uh, roughly uh, oh, two, uh, 1998 to 2008, uh, visiting my, uh, two of my sons who were living at the Champlain Housing across from the school. So I'm very familiar firsthand. I actually made comments on the parkway before the last public hearing, which was held in 2006. Um, we have a document that's 2009, and that document is, is old, stale, and invalid. Um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. I, the, I have, uh, as I said, in my family, uh, three, uh, what I would call, um, or ac actually four, uh, children uh, and in-laws uh, of them who are uh, um, uh, late uh, Gen X or early millennials. And right now, at this moment, in San Francisco, uh, there is a great event going on. Um, one of my sons is in Bangkok uh, watching it live at one of the two screens there, and maybe I have one or two others down here at the palace. And that event is the Metallica um, band playing with the, the San, Francisco, um, San Francisco Symphony. And it's actually the second time they did one, uh, a performance about uh, uh, 10 years ago. And so this is what's really going on now. I gave that up rather than going to the palace so I could be here. Um, 
first, I want to mention also there's a new, uh, a new folder from the Federal Highway Administration that I just got last week that you can pick up a copy of uh, if you don't have one when you leave. Um, and this does uh, provide some information, particularly on how roundabouts handle safely both pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, if we go down to the next slide, uh, I will give the standard, uh, the standard pitch, which is uh, Winiski is not a roundabout. It is a traffic circle. This happens to be a picture of the first roundabout built by New York State Department of Transportation in 1999. It was what? The replacement of a traffic circle with a roundabout. So the current, uh, uh, the current facility is that little round circle in the middle, and the larger one is a, a typical size uh, traffic circle, which is exactly uh, very close to the dimensions of what we have in Winooski. Um, Burlington is getting its first roundabout in a couple of years at the so-called Rotary, 125 feet diameter. Th uh, three of those Burlington roundabouts would fit easily in the Winooski traffic circle and have a lot of room left over. So we, we get that out of the way. Um, next photo is right now, and, there, and I, I want to emphasize that anyone here who would like to comment about the parkway can do so for the first time really since 2006 because the Pine Street Coalition, which I represent, is in U.S. District Court. We are f working to force a new um, design process that this generation would undertake. Uh, the last work was really done in the early 2000s, and I'm not sure how many people were around at that time, but a lot has changed in transportation since 2006. Uh, for example, well, that was a year before the iPhone was, uh, first iPhone was invented, and a year before the first network of uh, cycle track protected bike lines was actually installed in Montreal. Anyway, you can comment. The information is, I'll leave the sheets here until tomorrow night uh, by email or mail uh, about your concerns. This picture is to me worth at least 500 words, if not a thousand. It was taken earlier this week. It shows in the Pine, uh, the King Maple Street neighborhood on Pine Street, which is the second highest low-income area in the city, uh, of some, some students getting on the bus in the morning, the usual number. I believe it, it graphically shows the fact that there's a high minority population in that location. Uh, only poor area, uh, okay, 80, over 80% 80 of the people in that uh, particular location are low and moderate income. Go to the next uh, slide. Uh, this is the first roundabout that was built in Montpelier in 1995, first one this side of Vail, Colorado in North of Maryland. We'll go on to the next one. So they can be pretty and they can be small. This particular slide was, was uh, placed at the outreach meeting that was held two weeks ago by the state and the federal and the city because they hadn't done their homework on, um, uh, on environmental justice. The new rules since 2009 require that if you have a project that has a disproportionate or basically a greater impact on low-income areas than the rest of the uh, project area, that you have to minimize the impacts that it has on that low-income area. And what do we got here? If you look on the right-hand side, you'll see that the traffic increases on Maple to King and King to Main right through the core of the low-income uh, minority area. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you see the traffic is projected to decrease by 72% and 56% in what? The lower areas of Pine Street, which get the greatest benefit. I don't think it takes a genius to figure out who's getting the shaft in this particular case. And that will, this, we'll be using this uh, federal, uh, federal graph uh, that was presented by the consultants as we go on. Next. Uh, this is a, a mini roundabout, uh, has no central island. The cars can go over it uh, larger uh, down in Manchester Center, the first mini in Vermont. Next one. Uh, this is a roundabout which actually we believe could fit uh, at uh, Home Avenue and also at Flynn and Parkway in the project that would have a separate lane for bicyclists. You can see you have the bicycle lane and you also have the traditional crossings for pedestrians. Uh, it is the modern evol evol evolutionary um, design that uh, we're using today. I will only say a couple of more things because the time is short and I want to have a little, uh, one or two questions. One, there's not a single inch of new uh, sidewalk in this project. There's not a single inch of new separate bikeway in this project uh, and this project uh, basically disconnects the south end from 
Hannaford is already in place. If any of you have been trying to get down through that, that's been closed off for Hannaford's construction. That's a permanent closure that would occur for all modes. The project is hard to imagine, the project that's worse than this one. Uh, it's there, and we hope to basically stop it and start with a blank slate where everybody, including everybody here, would have a chance to participate in uh, its redesign. Do you have more slides? No? That's enough. Okay. Uh, so I know you said you wanted to take a couple questions. I'm going to ask one question and suggest we move on because if we start this conversation, we'll be here till midnight just on this one topic. Sure. Uh, so uh, my question for you is if people want more information or want to get more involved, um, how do they contact you um, is, and uh, how do they get more information about the parkway? Uh, SafeStreetsBurlington.com, uh, our website, or the uh, uh, Facebook uh, Pine Street Coalition will get you there. And uh, uh, if you, uh, I, I think this is the form. that has well, that's a that's a contact uh, to send to the uh, uh, to comment to the uh, uh, federal and state and city folks. Um, my, I I think you can. Um, I would suggest my, my email is, I'm a member of the steering committee of, of uh, NPA 23. My, yeah, my email and my uh, phone number is on the NPA list. Great. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. What's that? Is this yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you're going to speak from there, Jeff? That, that's perfect. Is, yeah. Is this yeah. good? Yeah. So you want, could you just introduce yourself and take off? Sure. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Glassberg. I, was retained by the city of Burlington last September to assist with work associated with the City Place Burlington project. Just want to start with a little background about myself. I know you have a lot of questions, uh, so I will try to get to them. Um, first, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening as a now retired 21-year school board member. I appreciate folks who dedicate their time to their communities, so thank you for that. Uh, my background is as a development project manager and owner's representative. I'm used to and had anticipated that my work on this project would include dealing with the typical sorts of problems associated with construction projects. I thought we'd be dealing with noise and dust, uh, budget challenges, changes in the work, let's say it's unfolded a little differently than, than that. Uh, what my joining this endeavor last September has provided, however, is some perspective. At that point, progress had stopped. It was pretty clear that there was a problem uh, and most of my focus since that time has been on trying to understand that problem, facilitate the city's interests in resolving it, and get to a point where the public, the city, have some clarity about the future that will unfold on the site. What I can tell you, what we know, pretty clear. We're sitting here on October 9th. The project that was permitted uh, is not going to be constructed. That is clear at this point. What comes next? When Jonathan sent me a reminder yesterday about this meeting tonight, he used the word saga. Uh, and I, I responded saying saga indeed. Um, I have felt at times as though I'm a character in a Russian novel where I just keep turning corners and there are more doors and you open that door and then you go into the next one. This saga is not written. There are many steps still to unfold. Can we expect that there will be a proposal from the current property owner, and that is an entity called BTC Mall Associates, can we expect that there will be another proposal from the current owner for development on that site? Yes, I expect so. I can't assure you of that, but that would appear to be the direction things have been going in. The logical question for all of you is, so why haven't we seen anything yet? And 
I can express to you that part of the challenge and part of the delay is as a result of both a changing cast of characters and a more easily understandable lack of agreement among the constituent owners of BTC Mall Associates about how to proceed. Those issues are still being worked out and they are clearly outside of the city's control. The city's role um, in a typical development project may be that of a regulator, you know, with planning and zoning, for instance. It may be that of a utility provider, be it electric, water, sewer, things of that nature. In this case, the city has another role and has had other interests. There are a lot of acronyms and a lot of history here, and I'm not sure where everybody stands relative to how we got here. But if I use the term TIF, am I just throwing jargon at you? Should I explain it? Or? Yeah, you got to explain it. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So in this case, what makes the city's role somewhat different than in a typical development project is that the, the city entered into an agreement with the developer. It's called the development agreement. And in that agreement, essentially, the structure that was put in place was one in which the city would acquire at the completion of construction city streets and sidewalks. If I boil this transaction down to its ultimate essence, that is what the transaction was. And those streets and sidewalks were to be paid with TIF funds. TIF, T-I-F, is tax increment financing. And in its simplest form, that is a structure in which a property prior to development might generate, say, $25 a year in tax revenue. Subsequent to new development on that site, it might generate $75 a year in tax revenue. So you have an increment between what it's currently generating and what it would generate of $50, okay? Essentially, this transaction was that the city would use that growth in increment to pay for the improvements to recreating the street grid, reconnecting Pine and St. Paul streets, so acquiring the, the land under those streets and making those improvements, and then to do improvements on uh, Bank and Cherry streets as well. And you probably have heard the term the city's great streets program and a series of standards associated with that. So that was the intent. Oh, somebody anticipated. So that, that in essence, this, this grid is, and this was part, I believe, of the information at the time of a vote by the public on how those dollars would be expended. And so the the priority blocks, if you will, were blocks five and six, the recreation of the, the street grid, uh, and then blocks one, two, three, and four along uh, Cherry Street, and blocks seven and eight along Bank Street were, were the balance of the proposed scope. So where we are today is that this developer has not continued construction. The funds that have been expended to this point in the demolition of the mall, uh, primarily, have been the developer's funds. The city's expenditures have been limited to engineering and design costs associated with improvements for Bank and Cherry Streets. 
There have obviously been other costs to the city in terms of staff time, uh, in terms of opportunity cost, uh, <laughs> what else the city might have been doing during this time. But in terms of dollars expended, those dollars associated with the demolition of the existing mall have been the developer's dollars. Uh, as we look to what the next steps may be, we can anticipate that a new proposal would result in a new review process. That unless the proposal is similar to what's already permitted, the entire regulatory process of the city will likely restart to consider a new proposal. That is both time consuming, but to some extent, I would hope that some of you hear that as perhaps an opportunity and a potential. Because I'm certainly aware, although it predated my involvement, I'm certainly aware of the concerns that were expressed by many project opponents regarding scale of the project, uh, as well as other elements. If there's a new project, it's likely, given what we know, to be smaller in scale and uh, more responsive to this marketplace. And I think that's the, the reason it has not proceeded. And so with that as an overview, I'm happy to try to address questions for the balance of the time that I'm here for. So we have for, for about 10 minutes of questions. Um, and I'm just going to go along this way, if that's all right. Um, could somebody pass him a microphone? Maybe not. Hang on. Hi. You said the ownership of the development corporation has changed. What was it and who is it now? So the, the ownership has not necessarily changed. There was an entity created called BTC Mall Associates, which owns the property. That's still the entity. That entity has constituent partners. The first partner with whom most of you are familiar was Don Sinex of an entity called Devonwood. In order to proceed with the project, he had to raise more equity capital to make the project go. He brought in as a partner Rouse Properties, a fairly well-known large national developer. They were involved in things like Quincy Marketplace, South Street Seaport, Baltimore, so on and so forth. Rouse was subsequently purchased by the entity Brookfield Properties. So Brookfield bought all of the assets and all of the liabilities of Rouse Properties. So the Brookfield entity is now the, the partner with Devonwood in BTC Mall Associates. Have I answered your question? Uh, my question is about Brookfield Asset Management. Um, they have a history, uh, particularly in the Amazon, of uh, pushing for uh, oil uh, pipelines to get through the Amazon. On top of that, uh, when the local uh, Brazilian uh, leader who was a fascist was elected, um, their CEO talked about how excited they were to do business in that country and hopefully buy off uh, public assets and privatize those assets. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering why we would want to do business with a company with that sort of track record, uh, particularly when we claim to be a net zero city uh, why we would want to work with someone who is actively trying to destroy the Amazon. Thank you. I think that might have been a rhetorical question, but do you, do you want to comment? I, I, I'm not sure I can respond to that. That's the owner of the property at this point. Um, is it your contention then that all the money that has gone into this project has come from the developer? 
So I, I want to clarify yeah. that the city has expended funds. I think I indicated this. The, for example, the city council approved a contract with an engineering firm that was in, engaged subject to the city's procurement process to design improvements for Cherry and Bank Streets. So that has been an expenditure directly by the city. Do you know how much? The contract itself was for approximately $1.1 million. The, the work was put on hold uh, when things began to slow down. And I believe, and I, I did check on some of this, so I'm going to use round numbers. I believe we're somewhere around seven hundred thousand dollars into that 1.1 million dollar contract at this point in okay, the last uh, question I have during this whole uh, development of the whole how much property taxes does somebody paying ta property taxes on that property so property taxes are still paid I can't quote you chapter and verse on, on what that is but it the property was not removed from the tax rolls. Kind of that we lost his property tax. So the the property tax bill on the uh, Burlington uh, City Place properties ha has been reduced by just over two hundred thousand dollars, two hundred six thousand and change less is being collected on an annual basis from those properties as a result of the, well, obviously the, uh, the, the, the empty lot, the building lot is worth less than the property was when it, when it had a building on it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And I just want to get a sense of how many other people have questions and Karen, how much time do we have? Uh, how? Well, wait. Yeah, I'll keep going. You have about six minutes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So I understand why a redesign might have been needed because I know the commercial office market fell. The bottom fell out of it in the last two years. And right? there's a lot of vacant space out there. We never get rented. Sharon and I have talked about one thing, though. <laughs> you know, I was going to put you on this one, which is, you know, we live in a city where people make a decision to live here for a year. So all leases are a year. We have transients, and I bet if you added up all the numbers of the apartments and the amount of, Nick Gerhard would know this, the amount of apartments in Burlington and the amount of people that occupy those, are we approaching 20% of the population? Um, Close enough. Yeah. So uh, Burlington's uh, percentage um, has about 10,200 rental units, um, and uh, I believe rentals are about, um, renters are about 50, 58% of the population. Okay. So those people are on one year leases. They don't have any skin in the game. So I wanted to know why, and we talked about this briefly one time, as to why they are not putting more purchasable units. And why isn't there not more of these that people can buy as condominiums? And have skin in the game and say, hey, why is this stuff on my sidewalk and why can't I walk here safely? And why aren't they, they, Because the voice, the renter voice is not the same as an owner voice. We know that, you know, there's a huge population that doesn't even vote in this town. But I'm wondering why it was not deemed necessary to say we need to have places where people can buy and live here and look at more of their future than only 365 days out. So I, I can't speak to the developer's reasoning for their plan. Uh, certainly from a, a regulatory perspective, the use as residential is something that the city controls. The tenure of that, whether it's rental or for sale, is not a regulatory issue per se. And what you're really addressing is perhaps a demand in the marketplace that somebody should be looking to fill. 
Uh, my question is about the relationship between the, the TIF monies and a scaled down project. When the project was being, uh, being approved and, and debated, one of the arguments that was uh, offered by the developer was that well, it had to be 14 stories in order to support uh, that kind of TIF increment. As you, as, you, as you noted, if you have a smaller project, your increment's going to get smaller. Well, we have a, a fixed figure, I think, of something like $22 million in TIF funds that the projected project was intended or anticipated to generate. So if we end up with a $100 million project instead, uh, that's not going to match up very well with uh, with the TIF, what happens in a case like that? I, I think broadly your recap of that is correct. That is a, a risk in a downsized project is that there would be less increment. The language that voters approved actually prioritized how money would be spent if there wasn't enough to go around and so the blocks were listed in priority order. So the answer to your question is there would be less available, fewer blocks completed. And, and, and then just a nuance on that, there are different ways to perhaps allocate funds. So the city might from a planning perspective say what we want to take care of is everything that's beneath the streets for all the streets and we'll get to above grade improvements over time or th you know through other means so it might not be two fully completed blocks and two blocks where nothing's done there could be opportunities to try to split that in in other ways okay. Sharon um, thank you um, I just wanted to speak to um, one issue which um, had to do with how much money the city has spent. I actually, um, a few weeks ago, asked Beth Anderson to get me that information because I thought it was germane. I was hoping to have that for tonight. Um, that was not forthcoming and I was told that it's a matter of the Department of Public Works and CEDO and I do want to remind you, Jeff, that your contract is part of that cost also, which we were expecting to have for just a year and then we, we did renew it because, as you stated, it's become a saga as opposed to just a project. Um, so I, I am hoping to get that information for you because I think it is germane. People do ask me, how much money have we spent? What if this doesn't move forward? How are we going to recoup those dollars? And I would like to know what I'm talking about for dollars. So I did want to make that statement. The other thing I wanted to say is that the housing mix, I think if indeed, if indeed this project gets redesigned, and I do believe it will, I think it is an opportunity for the community once again to look at it. I think the community supported the mix, but there would be another go around of saying, could the mix of housing be owner occupied and rental? We wanted to create workforce housing. We wanted it to have an affordable component, a strong affordable component, but that did not preclude people having owner occupied units, which could also be affordable. So um, I just wanted to speak to that also. Um, as far as TIF, my understanding is that if you have authority to borrow that amount, there's no, you're not, if you don't borrow that full amount, you don't have to pay it back. So I don't really, I don't see that as a big risk. I think that it's proportionate. Yes, we thought we were going to have a big project and we had dollars that went into that. My concern is if the money that comes back or the improvements don't generate as much of that increment financing, um, but we still have to shell out the same amount of money that for the construction of the streets, then there's that gap that I think you're trying to address. Great. Thank you. Th thank you, Sharon. Other questions or comments? Yep. Yes. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for uh, doing this. Um, so my question is, uh, you mentioned that you think there's opportunities for a scaled back project and that in your estimation, um, 
the owners are going to be looking at that. What do you see as opportunities for folks in the room to have input to that, uh, to that process and what kind of opportunities do you see there? So at a baseline, there will be an opportunity to participate in the regulatory process as, as a matter of fact. I think what you're really asking though is there was a long ramp up for the prior proposal and there were public sessions and you're asking I think w would there be something similar to that? Well, one would hope from a public relations perspective that there would be a similar effort to engage and doing so in advance of, in preparation for a regulatory process is certainly a really smart thing to do. So I, it's, it's something the city can certainly encourage. We can lead the horse to water, let's hope they drink. Can I ask a quick follow-up, um, which is, do you anticipate the city uh, potentially renegotiating the development um, agreement um, and that being another point of uh, potential uh, opportunity for, for change? Uh, yes, because the agreement to some extent, Sandy Baird's the attorney, tell me if I'm wrong, it, it, to some extent is going to be moot. I mean, the agreement opens with a description of a project that's not being built, then it has a series of dates that haven't been met. So I think we're either looking at significant amendment to an existing agreement or a new sheet of paper. And here at the end, with time running out, and that whole agreement was prefaced on access to tax increment financing. If certain deadlines aren't met, the carrot that brought them into that agreement may not be there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff, for um, for doing a presentation. And if people want more information, how do they contact you? Or are you uh, available for public uh, interactions? Or what's what's that look like? I try to be responsive. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And oh, uh, I, so uh, an important point, Councillor Roof is is reminding me, is that one thing that has occurred during this period is that. The streets that are indicated as five and six, so the continuation of Pine and St. Paul streets, are now included on the official city map. And so what that does in terms of a new development proposal is it essentially stakes out that ground for that purpose. Uh, and that was not the case prior to the, the application for the plan that's now not being implemented. That was a long sentence. <laughs> Great. If we, if they don't make the deadline. Okay. Important question. Yep. Make so sure if we don't, TIF had to be the, there's deadlines with this. If since nothing, you know, we couldn't get Brookville to come to us. We've been inviting them because, and they have nothing to say. They're very honest. So how will we build those streets if we're offering it for the next developer or whatever if we don't have the TIF money? There could be other sources of funding, but if the public is going to take private property for public purpose, there's a cost associated with that. So the slick idea in, in the way this was set up was that the cost of that ground was part of the overall transaction. If this were on a one-off basis and the city wanted to enforce its rights under the map, the city takes other property for, for public purposes and this would be similar, I expect. Great, thank you. So we're gonna move on. Um, and this is a conversation maybe you can continue um, offline um, or perhaps we can invite you back. We'll, we'll see. Um, but thank you, Jeff. And um, next up are folks from the Tenants Union. And um, it's an important topic, uh, a big topic, and the 
well, I understand from these folks is that what they want to do is do a presentation tonight. Uh, they have lots of material here, so you can contact them. But this is more of a information for you thing than than a real conversation for this evening. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Thank take it away. Know. If you do introduce yourselves, please. And, yeah. uh, so I am Charles Winkleman. Uh, Dan Daniel. Um, and the Burlington Tenants Union. Uh, there are right now, I'd say, about 15 to 20 core members. Um, and we have been ramping up over the last few months. Uh, we have been working on tenant issues for some time now. Um, some of you in the room might know that I've worked on boycott boves, uh, exploring some of the slumlording that the boves have done. Uh, we've been working on forming counseling clinics and resources for tenants dealing with landlords uh, regarding health and safety and legal violations. Uh, we've been developing support for low and no income residents, uh, both housed and unhoused. And we've also been organizing several educational pickets of known slumlords to bring attention to repeat offenders who operate with impunity um, and oftentimes with the support of the city government and elected officials. 60% uh, of Burlington residents are tenants. We average f spending 44% of our income on housing. This is unacceptable. Fine tuning this won't change. Building more market rate units won't change that. It's not a flaw in the system. This is what the system, the housing system, one that is for profit is meant to do. Uh, next screen, please. Uh, sorry for the screen grab. Uh, this is an interesting difference in rent inflation between the highest and lowest Quintile from 2009 to 2011. Similar differences show up looking at 1993 to 2013. Uh, something like this might be why, even though we have a city where upwards of 60% of residents are tenants, 10 out of 13 city councilors are homeowners and or landlords. Um, it might be why as a city, the city has done very little comparatively um, to support folks who are uh, low income and rent insecure, those who are facing uh, uh, unfair and unsafe housing conditions. Charles, could you explain quintile? Uh, uh, the quintile, it is uh, the 10th, a 10th percent, 20%, one, 20%, there you go. So the highest, the fifth is the fifth highest, 80% to 100%, the lowest would be zero to 20%. There you go, pass that math. Um, and, and for some reason, even though we have all these big issues, what the city and it seems the council is focusing on right now is putting cottages and backyards as you know, one of the most important issues. Uh, next slide. Now, although this slide is from Boston, um, a lot of what's happening in Burlington is very similar. Luxury housing, often called market rate housing, but truly not actually affordable to most workers, uh, is being built while low-income housing is disappearing. Uh, one thing to consider is that a report just came out that in the state of Vermont, over 10,000 naturally uh, occurring affordable units for low-income folks have disappeared since 1990. Um, in that same time span, 25,000 luxury units have been built. Uh, next slide, please. And that's a big part of what happened. Uh, there's been a severe reduction in low-cost apartments since 2000. Uh, as a local example, over the past couple of years, Bissonnette in the Old North End has removed over 300 units of low-income housing through legal ev legally evicting Section 8 tenants uh, and other low-income tenants. Those folks have moved elsewhere. I just read an article today from Vermont Digger about how we have less people riding buses uh, using public transportation now. And there's no question in my mind that has directly co correlated to the gentrification and displacement that is happening in the Old North End. Uh, this morning, also in particular, uh, we were just told that Bissonnette is charging $200 for a credit check uh, to prospective tenants. Um, if that's legal, it shouldn't be. Uh, and if that's not legal, there should be some enforcement, which is not happening at all. One of the things that we're looking to do is tenant counseling. There are many resources and services out there to help a tenant um, who are having housing issues, but many of those resources are only open uh, Monday through Friday, eight to five. Uh, many of them are scattered throughout a lot of different agencies. For example, 211 uh, just lost funding from the state and they're cutting back their uh, support for emergency housing on the weekends. 
for those who are unhoused or, or are facing uh, a potential uh, situation. We are hoping to develop a central resource base and in the process, uh, train folks to do tenant counseling to help people through the various issues uh, that they are confronted with. Um, one term that's been used is, is solidarity case management, where we're working with folks kind of like social workers, but we're not doing it under the umbrella of a nonprofit. We're not looking for anything in return. Another thing that we've been doing recently is helping someone whose 70-year-old mother lost her housing and was going to be evicted. We have helped folks document health hazards, help guide folks through the code enforcement process, which is incredibly confusing. We are not lawyers and we don't pretend to be, but we are neighbors and we can help each other with both knowledge and support. Uh, one of the things that we are very much interested in pushing forward on the city level is rent control, just cause eviction and vacancy control. We believe that housing is a human right, that everyone does deserve housing, um, that a lot of renters actually do invest in their community in a ton of ways, uh, and that they deserve the same exact rights that everyone else has. We also want to ensure that code enforcement is doing their job and has the resources to do their job. We want landlords to be licensed so that if a landlord is not doing their job, they can lose that license and no longer be allowed to rent. It is a business, after all. And we also want the city uh, and Mayor Weinberger, who have promised uh, starting in 2012 or 13 that they would come up with a landlord database to finally bring that forward. It has been over seven years and we have yet to see this database come about. Uh, an, an issue that I know uh, occurs a lot in Ward 1 and 8 is quality of life issue regarding students living downtown. Move I'll, I'll move ahead in just one second. One of the things that I just want to say is that uh, students often face incredibly high rents from universities, particularly UVM and Champlain College. They pay upwards of $800 a month to share a dorm room. Students are taken advantage of as renters just like everyone else. Um, can we go, let's go to the last slide, which is a summit slide. Um, so just very briefly, um, although there's, as you can see, there's a lot of work for a small group to take on. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we need as many of the 25,000 renters in Burlington as possible to help us. So November 3rd, 12 to 5, in the Fletcher Free Library, we will be having a tenant summit put on by us tenants and for tenants. The su tenant summit is a day for us to share our stories as tenants, to help each other and learn from each other, to see the ways in, in what seems to be an individual problem or a failing is not a failure of any of us but actually the reality of doing business in a city where landlords are allowed to do what they want and housing is seen as a way to invest and make a profit, where housing and real estate interests are taken above and made more important than renters and folks who live there. We hope to clarify our needs and goals as a union and develop campaigns to move forward. Together we will build a movement to help our neighbors in need to get our needs met and to bring about housing as a human right, not just in Burlington, but in Chittenden County and eventually the state of Vermont. So that's November 3rd, 12 to 5 p.m. There will be lunch and childcare. Thank you. Uh, and it's uh, burlingtontenantsunion.com is our website. And if anyone has a question, I guess we can answer one quickly. No, never mind. Oh, you have a question, you can talk <laughs> to us can, or can, email catch, us. Catch him, will you be here at the end of the meeting? Or Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Did, did, you're done? Okay, great. Thank you, and I'm sorry to cut it off, but, but once we get started, we'll just be, uh, it'll be very hard to, to stop, and it's a, it's a rich topic. I understand that, so I'd like to get, do it justice by having enough time, um, and we don't here this evening. So um, I'd ask that we move on to the, uh, uh, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, if you want to catch them out in the hall, I think you, you might be able to do that now. Um, and the city councilors updates, do we have any preferences to who starts? Adam, do you want to um, everybody's deferring to everybody else. I'll start. Thank you, Sharon. Oops, it's all caught. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, so it's been a busy time. It, it continues to be a very busy time. We've touched on a number of the key topics that you all care about. Um, one of the things that happened on at Monday night's meeting was that um, I sponsored a resolution that talked about the the funds that we received when we sold BT 
and a process that would be clearly identified for the public to understand what we're going to, how we're going to deal with those funds. Are we going to reinvest some of them? How are we going to, what are the relative risks if we do that? And so that's out for you all to look at. Um, and it is, it, the door is open. This, this resolution didn't decide what would happen to the funds. It just identified a process and what information the council and the community, the council needed on behalf of the community to make a good decision with those dollars. And those dollars are between six and seven million dollars. Um, that's what's, that was the money that the city got from the sale of BT. So I just wanted you all to know that. Um, the second thing was already identified um, a little bit by the previous speaker about the, the housing policy um, that the, the mayor held some housing summits, one early on and then another one in September. The September meeting actually had a different flavor because unfortunately the people that just were here are not here now, but tenants came to that meeting. They identified themselves as tenants or renters and they, and they voiced concerns about this, the policy not really identifying or, or focusing on some of their needs. And so um, the policy, the resolution that we adopted deals with looking at improving energy efficiency in rental housing, encouraging creation of accessory dwelling units, creating a regulatory framework for short-term rentals, revising the requirements for uh, creation and use of parking spaces and increasing or considering increasing the dedicated revenue for the housing trust fund which helps uh, fund affordable housing units. However, as a result of the second meeting, um, the mayor recognized, and so voices do matter when you come to meetings, it does matter and it does make a difference. So in the action, in the resolution, um, the Community and Economic Development Office is going to complete, complete a review of tenant protections and deliver the review and recommendations for additional protection to the City Council by the end of October. We have a meeting October 28th, so that will be another part of the discussion. That, that workload will go to the CDNR committee and um, the rest of the issues that I identified will be either going to the City Council Ordinance Committee or to a combined ordinance, City Council Ordinance Planning uh, Commission uh, meeting. And so if you're interested in the topics that I identified, those five that I identified, um, those joint meetings begin actually next Tuesday. Um, the first one is on the 15th and it's in the Fletcher Free Library and it starts at 6. Um, I don't know what the agenda will be uh, because we have not received it yet. Um, the second meeting is October 22nd and that's going to be in the Miller Center. Once again, I'm not sure what the agenda will be and I'm not sure if the third date has been identified. But I did want to um, mention that, sorry. Uh, could you repeat those dates and, and what, the, what the meeting is about, just briefly? The meeting is about changing um, ordinances um, regarding the five topics. Um, so one of them is the time of sale ordinance to improve energy efficiency in rental housing. The other is an ordinance dealing with accessory dwelling units. The other is creating, doesn't have any right now, a regulatory framework really for short-term rental units. Um, the fourth one is looking at, this, these are ordinances regarding um, creation and use of parking spaces. And the last really is um, the housing trust fund is actually a conversation that will happen in the charter change committee. Um, the dates for these are the first meeting is October 15th, which is next Tuesday, and that is it starts at six, and it will be in the Fletcher Free Library, I believe the community room, that's usually where we meet, I can't guarantee the room. The second meeting is October 22nd, and that will be in the Miller Center. And there will be another meeting, but that has not been nailed down yet, 
and right. the location to be determined. Thank you. Um, so the last thing I wanted to, oops, go ahead. We're, we're getting close on time. I know, but yeah. the last thing I wanted to say is um, I, I love representing this ward. I worked really hard when I was a, when I worked I re, and was a city councilor. I retired. I have more energy. I feel that I'm still relevant, and so I'm letting you know that I am planning to seek re-election, and I just wanted you all to know that first. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jack, are you ready to go, or do we do? Yeah. Great, so um, Sharon spoke to, I think that was, there, there were two really big items on, on Monday at this past city council meeting, and this housing one was obviously one, and that's been in the works for a few months, and then I'll let um, Councilor Roof speak to the other, which, which he brought forth, um, which was also a big, big and important and exciting um, policy change. Um, so, but with the housing ones, I've been, working really hard on two of them in particular. Um, one is the requirements around energy efficiency and rental units. This was something that I campaigned pretty, pretty heavily on um, when I ran for the council in, in the winter and spring. Um, and I think it's, it's a really critical policy that addresses both um, high costs of living that a lot of folks are struggling with and experiencing at, while also addressing climate change and reducing our emissions. Um, and the, the, uh, the underlying idea behind it is that um, right now we have a lot of, especially in wards one and eight, we have a lot of rental units that are um, very inefficient. There's a lot of um, basically air, air leakage and so people are spending a lot of money to, to heat the outdoors. Um, so being mindful of time, this is something that I've been working on deeply and I think there's a lot of details around this policy that need to be worked out in terms of how you actually enforce it, what, this, what the standards are, what the timeline is for compliance. Um, so there's a lot of details that need to be worked out. So I hope people will get involved and get engaged on that. And the other one that I've been involved with is around the elimination of the mandatory parking minimums. This is something that people don't, it's a policy that people don't necessarily think too much about, but it does have pretty big implications. And the biggest thing that I've been pushing for around that is that as we eliminate these um, mandatory parking minimums that we also require developers to um, invest in alternative forms of transportation um, to really facilitate that move. Uh, away from car-centered infrastructure towards um, alternatives. Again, hitting both on the cost of housing and also on climate change. Um, so I was told to be quick. So those are the two things that I wanted to hit on and that I'm working on that I hope that you all will engage with and get involved with. Thank you. And I've been told to go really quick, so I'm going to lightning around this. Um, just a few quick updates. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, the Special Committee on Policing, which is something that I helped put together a few uh, months ago, if you all recall, uh, one of its members had to resign, so there's an opening on that. If you go to the, the city clerk's website, I believe we have that reposted, so we'll have to do a, a, reappoint, a reappointment for one member of that committee. Um, there's also just, uh, Chicky had brought something up about the, the housing database, and that's an important thing. I talked about this on, on Monday as part of an update uh, that I gave. <clears throat> the city, now that they've done the, the five-star review on all the properties in Burlington, they are now ready to release that. Uh, and they're not just release, we're not, we don't just want to release it in the form of a big Excel sheet because that's sort of useless. Um, we want to put it into an application that can actually be used so you can search properties and get an idea of what kind of uh, landlord you may be getting into uh, a contract with. Uh, so that's an important. Excuse me, Adam, but could you ex just briefly explain what a five-star review is? The yeah, news. sorry. So um, a few years back, we had, inst we had instituted this five-star review, which essentially means if you're a really good landlord, you get five stars, which means that you have five years before you have to come back for a certificate of occupancy. 
not for the best of the best. Uh, four stars is four years, three, two, one. So the, the worst landlords are getting, they have to come back every year. That's just a few things. It, it allows code enforcement to focus more consistently on the landlords that are problematic. And then when we turn that and make it public facing, it can be a piece of information, one of many that, that renters or prospective tennis. renters can use to make decisions. Uh, and we want to put that into an app where people can go here on the desktop uh, to have it be searchable and a little bit more usable. Um, City councilors here, we three plus a few others met with the new UVM president. Was that yesterday? Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness, that was yesterday. It's <laughs> yeah, been a long 24 hours. Um, we talked about, as you can imagine, housing, quality of life uh, in our neighborhoods. And I think it was, it was short but positive. And we have another one coming up next week. So uh, while he's coming in, we're also going out and trying to do some work. Uh, two things relating to voting. Uh, another application that is through the, what's called the community innovation proposal that we're working on is try to make an application again for desktop and mobile, much like with the housing, to allow people, uh, whether you're renters or otherwise, uh, to, to know where to, where, where to, it's hard to know where to vote sometimes in Burlington, depending on what the year is. Uh, and then some other information as well. So voter education is something that the council is working on. Uh, and then what Councillor Han Hansen mentioned for a while, I've been uh, I've been working on voting for many years, and, and one thing that I've uh, decided to bring forward, or really br bring forward again, I shouldn't take credit for this, so I won't, uh, is this contemplation of whether we in Burlington should um, afford legal Burlington residents who do not meet citizenship status the opportunity to vote on local matters, not state, not federal, but local matters. Uh, this would require a charter change, and so on Monday we, we referred that to the charter change committee by a vote to 10 to 2. Committee will take a look at it, bring some language back, it'll have to get voted on by the council, voted on by the public, if it passes both, both sides of the state legislature, and then we'll require a signature of the governor. So that will take some long process, but that's been um, a topic of conversation for the last few days. And we have a, a, a legal resident, but non-citizen, who might have a question about that. Can you speak about the, if you met with the president of UVM, can you speak about whether the agreement with the memorandum oh, yeah. of understanding is, is a public document? And if it yeah. is, where yeah. is it? And if it's not, why isn't it public? Yeah, you, 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 would, you would mention that and, and all three of us failed to, to remember. So thank you for reminding us and Sharon, correct me if I get wrong. I think between the two of us we'll know. Uh, it is public. It's, this, it's, not an, it's not a renewal, it was an extension of what we had for the last agreement, and that was primarily because with Tom Sullivan leaving and Suresh Caramel coming in, there wasn't a, a, a cohesive group for, for the administration, not, it's not really the council's job, but for the administration to negotiate on. And so that was, the, by my understanding from the administration, the reason for an extension of that, but it was not a renewal. So the intention is to get in negotiations once, once Suresh gets, uh, gets his, his bearings. Is that accurate? Sharon, I think that's right. Yeah. It is yeah. accurate. Yeah. All right. It was not a renewal. Quick question about the uh, housing database. Um, yeah. I realize for consumers that uh, an app is more useful, but for those of us who do housing research, an Excel spreadsheet is really helpful. So, yeah, it's not one or the other. It's, it's okay. for you, we'll give you this, the, the Excel file, but for <laughs> everyone else in town, we'll have the app. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was, was lightning round for all three of you. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have more time at other meetings. We just packed the agenda on this one, so uh, apologies from the steering committee. So next up is John Vickery, who's the city assessor. John, take it away. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm gonna try to be brief to the point um, so that there can be questions and answer time. Um, we are, uh, it's, it's been about 14 years since we did the last citywide reevaluation in, in 2005, finished in 2006. And uh, so we were given a letter to, by the State of Vermont Tax Department to mandate another reevaluation. So we're in the process of complying with that mandate. And uh, so we're, we uh, are doing a lot in our office to, to um, begin that process. We have several contractors and we're switching over to a new uh, valuation system, updating and modernizing uh, the, the software in our office. Um, this revaluation is a two-year revaluation, and the new values will be as of April 1st, 2021. And the new tax bills with the new valuations will be July of 2021. Uh, so, uh, the company that we've hired is Tyler Technologies, 
and they will have uh, people that'll be in the office um, as well as out in the field. They'll be asking folks for, for inspections. Um, the, the appraisers for Tyler are all uh, certified and trained. Uh, they will have badges and identification. Um, and so if uh, they will let you know that they're coming as well, they're gonna try to make appointments to people's properties. Uh, recently, uh, a week ago, we mailed out letters to everyone uh, with their property data. First off, it was to announce the revaluation. Uh, it, we sent them all to the, all the residential properties. And on the second back side of the, of the page, uh, there we uh, imported property data of taxpayers' property. And uh, please uh, look it over, and if there are corrections to be made, we would like to have you note that, and we will make those corrections. We're, we're collecting them right now. A lot of people are dropping them off. Other people are uh, turning them into PDFs and emailing them back to us, um, and others are taking photos and then sending them to us. So we're getting them in a lot of very various ways, um, but we want the data to be correct because we want your assessment to be fair. And you could also take a look at our website. We have uh, a lot of good information about the revaluation on the website. So I am open for questions. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, this is a question that I got um, recently, and, and to be honest, I didn't know the full answer, so I'm, I'm going to ask it uh, for my own benefit and benefit for others. Um, the, by my understanding, the assessment, the reassessment uh, is required, I think, by statute to be revenue neutral, <coughs> correct? The, the charter has a, a provision that it be revenue neutral for the municipal uh, tax rate. There's two components of the tax rate. There's the, an education tax rate, which is about two-thirds of the overall tax rate, and then there's the municipal tax rate. There's a, that provision is, is provided in the city charter. Gotcha. And so if the this second part of this question, uh, which, which I got, was if, the, if it's assumed that many of the properties, if not most of the properties in Burlington, are underassessed and the, their assessments will go up, does that mean, which would argue if the, if the municipal rate stays the same, then revenue would go up. So that, does that mean that on measure the rate would have to come down to maintain the fact that it would be revenue neutral? That's correct. On measure, the tax rate would have to go down to offset the increase in property values. O overall, uh, our values have increased. Uh, we're in a nice market right now. Uh, and, but the, the change in values have not been uniform uh, depending on, based on property type or location. So there's a lot of different market forces that, that, that will affect property value. And then last piece of the question, and this is one that I had a harder time answering, um, in what ways will this look like some, there's, there'll be winners and losers in a sense, and in what ways does it look like to be a winner versus a loser, and what's the, the scale of, of those wins and losses for different properties or parts of town? Is there any kind of anticipation that people can uh, anticipate? I suppose? <laughs> Been a long 24 hours. Um, I'm, I'm assuming when you say losers, you mean someone that has to pay more taxes than they did in the past. <laughs> yeah, well, they. Yeah. That would be a loser. You might say that those folks have been benefiting for the last couple of years. Um, so we want to correct and we want to be fair. So uh, our assessments, we want them to represent market. So uh, that's it's really a process of fairness and not whether someone's a winner or a loser. Um, obviously, there will be folks that will be paying more in taxes. There will actually be folks that will, um, properties that will, based on their value, will be paying less in taxes as well. Um, overall, uh, the change should be about similar. Um, Again, uh, depending on where you're located or, or what property type you have, uh, will depend on the change. It's it's not a it's not an indexing of value, but rather grabbing the property information and doing lots of market studies and adjusting land values. There's a lot of lot of testing that goes on um, every every few months. Uh, you run tests, you run tests, and you, you by the time you deliver the product, you hope that you're close, and then at that point, the public. Uh, is again involved as uh, like we our letters are the first part of the public involvement but we're hoping that we are very open with this process uh, we want to be able to put the data online and have it available to everybody as we have been 
Um, and then there'll be the opportunity for property owners to visit the Tyler team and to chat about their property and ask questions and make corrections if, if necessary. Uh, and our office will be involved in, in uh, making sure that happens. Okay. All right. And we have about five minutes on this topic. Hi, John. Thanks uh, for coming and explaining um, the uh, arcana of um, reappraisal. Uh, I have a question for you. Having been involved um, in a couple of reappraisals in the past, uh, I recall back in the 80s and again in the 90s that there was a um, sort of a sector shift um, from um, commercial uh, commercial property values to residential, um, and that when, as a class of properties, um, residential properties um, uh, wound up paying more, largely because as a whole, uh, they tend to appreciate um, more rapidly than commercial properties. Um, we're uh, coming off of, you know, the big, um, uh, mortgage uh, financial crisis and, and mortgage crisis back in 08 and I'm wondering um, if that sort of traditional uh, thing that happens during reappraisal and shifting from commercial values to uh, prop residential values whether um, you think that's going to happen uh, this time around uh, and whether or not the uh, 08 um, housing you know, devaluation or you know we actually had lower uh, increases for a couple of years whether that might affect uh, affect that in some way uh, that's you have good memory. Um, that was the when uh, there was some creation of the the 120 percent factor that we call, uh, which was um, shifting the burden back onto commercial properties because the reappraisal as a result of it, uh, residential properties had a much larger increase. The last reappraisal that we did in, in two, uh, uh, 2005, as effective 2006, um, that shift was not as uh, as large as the prior. Revaluation, and um, obviously there's going to be more studying to do, uh, but we have some sense of the market because we we monitor it a lot actually. Um, th I don't think we're going to see that kind of dramatic shifting. I'm pretty sure certain of that, and um, so therefore, I th I'm hoping that everything goes very smoothly as it can be. Hi, John. Uh, quick question on the timeline: when would I expect a appraiser to come by? And when would the, the generally the appraisal uh, period end? And then um, when would people have a chance to uh, petition for a different value if, if they see that as needed? Okay, um, good questions. So the, the Tyler team uh, has We've already been giving them a lot of data and they're doing a lot of uh, analysis behind the scenes and as well as we're converting our, 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 our valuation system right now. It's, it's pretty much finished actually. Um, so they're going to be uh, a more regular presence in, in City Hall um, in the next week or so. And um, they are, it, unlike the last reappraisal, they're not going to have 10 to 15 data collectors uh, combing the neighborhoods. It's more targeted. There's going to be fewer, fewer personnel, but they're going to be um, much highly trained appraisers. Uh, and they, what they're going to do is uh, request inspections of properties that have had some changes or where there is some questions about the data, uh, and where. Uh, there has are, have been some changes that need to be updated. So it's a little bit more targeted in that way. Um, and a lot of the analysis nowadays is conducted by the computer and by uh, lots of resources um, like MLS and um, imaging and, and, and sketch reviews. And, and uh, so there's, it's, the techniques are changing. So there, it's a little bit less of a large group of folks um, visiting every home. To answer the question, um, it'll be over the next year or so, the major part of the data collection. Then the informal hearings will be in January of 2021. Okay. So thank you. Uh, if people have additional questions afterwards when they get the letters or when they read the letters, um, they can just they contact your office. Is that 
Is that right? A absolutely. We, we've, we've had a lot of calls and we've been very busy, but whenever, whenever anybody stops down to the office, we will give them time uh, as well as try to reach out with them and talk to every, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you. So as you no doubt recall, um, DPW has come in several times over the last number of months. Um, this body has been particularly interested in the uh, areas of sidewalk that need re uh, repair because they're trip and fall hazards. They make it difficult for, they're not accessible, that kind of thing. So Chapin and DPW have been very responsive, um, uh, promised us a, a chunk of money to address those areas and we're, we just asked him to give us an update. So take it away, Chapin. Great, thank you so much. Chapin Spencer, Director of Public Works. And it's not often that the city assessor gets to generate as many comments and questions as Public Works. <laughs> so thanks, John, for starting us off here. Uh, yes, back in July, uh, you all had a number of questions regarding sidewalk. We wanted to take that opportunity to talk to you today uh, and provide uh, some more answers to your questions. Uh, we have Laura Wheelock, Senior Engineer, and Olivia Doris, Engineer for Public Works. Uh, let's see, one of the presentations tonight was on the Champlain Parkway from the Pine Street Coalition. Uh, we would like to get out some baseline information on that project, so we're circulating uh, that PowerPoint that we have delivered at various NPAs for your review. So with that, uh, we had a strong year of pedestrian improvements and really appreciate everybody's patience during a uh, ambitious construction year. Uh, we have succeeded in exceeding our three-mile uh, benchmark of sidewalk reconstruction this year. And as you know, we've talked about the 130 miles that we have in the 40-year lifespan of sidewalk. So we really need to be doing at least three miles a year to hit a sustainable level. Uh, so let's hit the next slide. This is all consistent with the sustainable infrastructure plan. And thanks to your support in 2016 for funding uh, a bond that is helping propel much of this work. So I'm going to turn it over to this point to Laura and to Olivia, and we'll take questions at the end. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Laura Wheelock, DPW Senior Public Works Engineer. Uh, I help oversee and manage the street and sidewalk program. Uh, up on the screen is just some of our achievements of work pedestrian orientated this season. Uh, installation, it's actually over a dozen crosswalks by the time that we complete. Accessibility enhancements, curb ramps, other safety repairs. Um, a lot of it triggered with the enhanced paving program uh, and the complete streets efforts. For sidewalk work, um, specific inside Ward 1 and Ward 8, um, going into the season in April, we had Grove Street, North Street, Pomeroy, and South Union having significant sections of their sidewalk being replaced. Uh, there was also early in the season a completion of intersection and pedestrian improvements at the Barrett Colchester intersection. Midway through the year, the city council graciously approved an additional $568,000 towards uh, sidewalks specifically. With that approval, we've uh, done what we could to pivot mid work plan. Uh, understanding our contractor already had a full plate and our right of way crews had a pretty full plate already. Uh, so we were able to squeeze in work on Rose Street, Charity, Blondin, Colchester, Randy, and Institute um, so far this season. Go ahead. So just to kind of go over a little bit how um, we had put together and the sidewalk program works, um, I do want to mention that a copy of the presentation, I'm sorry about the ringing, uh, that we're giving right now is available at the front desk. Uh, as well as some copies of our sidewalk work plan. This is something that DPW went and presented to the City Council or um, the DPW Commission in May of 2016. It takes our sidewalk inventory, our technical data, puts a barrier score. So that is the actual ADA based deficiencies that are experienced within the sidewalk pairs it with an activity score. This is our tendency to use the sidewalk, how many pedestrians, uh, and frequency that we expect people to be using it and gives us our priority score from that technical data. This priority score is what we then use to review and target based on our available funding where we are going to allocate that work. Uh, it gives it more of a, a broad base across the city. We're only a few people and we have 130 miles of sidewalks and that's a lot of, a lot of miles to cover. Um, so the types of projects where this money goes into using the priority score are safety improvements, 
These are significant uh, displacements of sidewalk, cracked panels with large gaps that are missing, um, rocking panels, those types of really, really concerning areas. The remainder of the funding then gets focused towards generally the long runs. We want to get our infrastructure back up to being able to be maintained in a sustainable way. And so to do that, we are looking to do block by block type approaches to replacing the sidewalks. Um, we do recognize that some of our runs as they were analyzed in the system, um, especially when you get towards the new north end, are quite long. Uh, even out here in Ward 1 end up being a pretty sizable stretch. Those stretches don't always need to be replaced. Sometimes there's good sidewalks in the middle, and that's where we would make use of the localized repairs. Maybe we only need to replace 100 feet of 400 feet to make that sidewalk be in good condition. Uh, the alternative repair speaks to our sidewalk cutting program, where we look to take sidewalks that we've replaced in the last 10 years or so and uh, shave them down. Usually this is needed for tree roots that have pushed up sidewalk panels. This is a way to have them maintain their life until they get to about their 40-year replacement. So what informs our work plan? Inside of this document, you'll see the, the very technical aspects of it, what we are looking to achieve. Um, but that's not the only thing that we do consider. Um, we have the infrastructure plan that was improved in 2016 that we also go by our, white, our walk bike plan and our C-click fix. And I think that's one of the things that Chapin had spoke to you guys about. There are things inside of the technical inventory that just are not captured. And it really relates to more of the safety criteria. We can see the vertical displacements, but what we can't necessarily see are the gaps in the sidewalk or the rocking panels. That is where we do rely on residents, city officials sometimes, um, business owners to be able to go in, click a picture, send us a note, give us a phone call, give us an address, and say, hey, the sidewalk has a concern. Um, we then send our technicians out. We, we measure it. We, you want me to grab another one? Thank you. Um, we measure it, we quantify it, and then we can add it into our work plan. We are focused, this is totally my fault, sorry. Um, <laughs> we are focused on trying to uh, remove our safety repairs as it relates to our network. Um, we recognize these are the ones that are the most apt to literally trip people up. Uh, and that's what we want to address first in our work plan, and then we move on to the long runs. Um, also keeping in mind some of our govern governing um, documents and available funding. So our next, our next steps, um, we're gonna finish our work plan for this year. Um, we're running, uh, starting to get a lot colder. Our right away group uh, doesn't work past the end of October on sidewalk work. They need to get our snow plows ready and they need to get ready for leaves. Uh, our contractor usually can work a little bit later in the season, uh, but they, they also do need to be mindful of the weather. We wanna make sure that we're getting in good quality work for the money that we're spending. What is happening inside D DPW right now is that we are working on our next season's sidewalk work plan. Uh, we have gone out, we've taken especially the information that we've gotten um, since the last NPA meeting here. We've done our inspections, we've done our quantifications of those that have been sent into DPW. We also are comparing that against the inventory that's referenced in the sidewalk work plan and coming up looking at our available funding and finding out what our, our three miles is gonna consist of next season. It's not finalized, it's certainly not ready for public consumption, um, but it is usually something that we bring to the DPW Commission in about January or February. Um, the other thing that we are working on is getting an update of our assessment. The assessment was collected in fall of 2014. We've obviously done a lot of work since then. Um, and we want to try to refine some of the challenges that we do have with our existing inventory to be able to make it, I'm so sorry, uh, be a little bit better of a workable plan for everyone. So to talk a little bit about the capital improvements that are, um, we use 
other people's other other funding sources to be able to, to facilitate. These are enhancements within the existing right of way. They are not necessarily a maintenance and replacement type project. Uh, those funding sources include the CCRPC, VTRANS grants, um, and federal highway earmark type grants. We apply for these a lot. Uh, we have a transportation planning group that actually has been very successful in receiving these these monies, um, and it's great. It it costs us 20% of the project to be able to implement these. Olivia is going to speak to two of them that happen to be in Ward 1. Okay, so the first one um, is a project many of you are probably very familiar with. Um, it's been in the works for a few years, and this is a project that um, has some federal and state funding um, assisting us, so that's great. Um, uh, the, whoops. Um, this project will replace the sidewalk along Colchester Avenue um, from South Prospect Street to East Avenue. Um, so um, it will replace it with a 10 foot wide multi-use path which will better accommodate um, bicycles and pedestrians on that stretch. Um, so we hope to have, we're in the final, um, the contract plan stages currently with VTRANS and the design engineer, and we hope to put that out to bid in December or early January so that it can move to construction um, this coming spring. So, and so kind of a newer, um, our most recent effort is getting the Mansfield F side path and traffic calming project up and running. Um, many of you have probably seen um, the surveyors out there um, collecting data and um, okay. um, <clears throat> so we've uh, selected a de design engineer to start this process. Um, the, again, the project kind of consi consists of two components, one being the side path. Um, this will replace the sidewalk um, along East Avenue and extend that sidewalk along East Avenue, again, with uh, Mansfield Avenue. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Mansfield Avenue um, and replace it with a side path that, again, will better accommodate um, pedestrians and cyclists uh, um, you know, per the plan, plan BTV walk bike master plan. Um, this design prog progress will be presented at future public meetings, so keep your eye out um, for those. And then the other component being the traffic calming piece, um, which will involve um, a significant public outreach effort um, with that neighborhood. Um, the consultant is currently working on um, on design alternatives for that, and those alternatives will be presented at a neighborhood meeting this coming um, coming up in November. So again, keep your eyes out for that. And for the timeline, we hope to get through design this winter, and if all goes well, finalize designs in the spring and get to construction in the summer or the fall. So, thank you. That seems to be. Do you have anything before we go to questions? Uh, just, I mean, if you guys want to. We can leave this up for the questions time. This is just some of the other work that we are doing inside Ward 1, and so if you see things happening in these areas, uh, feel free to reach out to DPW, and, and we can get you in touch and get you some information. Great. Thank you. So questions, comments? Yeah. Um. Richard, why don't you, because you've got a microphone, why don't you go ahead and go with this gentleman. Uh, what's the prognosis for East Avenue traffic calming? Um, the prognosis is uh, the same as that I said in July. It's on the list. It's like third or fourth after our current set of projects. Uh, we are going to meet this winter, as we've heard from traffic calm requesters, to be able to be more responsive to these, that we are looking at how we can resource the projects differently to keep them moving forward. So we'll uh, keep you posted. Uh, uh, so in the meantime, will there be... What, what do you do? You've I, a, a problem has been identified. Traffic engineering is not going to deal with it probably at least until 2022, if I read your tea leaves right. Meanwhile, 
um, Deputy Chief Murad is here, and he's not doing any traffic enforcement, so how do we make it a safe street? Yep. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, like we talked about last uh, in July, uh, we are looking at whether there's quick build options that can be done in the interim. I know that there were requests uh, for RRFBs. We are looking at various strategies. We have applied for grants for the Colchester and East Ave intersection. Unfortunately, those were not successful. So we are uh, doing the behind the scenes work to get uh, this project moving forward. Yeah, I got a quick question about the uh, sidewalk on Colchester Avenue uh, that goes to East Avenue that's being upgraded. Is that going to include a jog that goes south on East Avenue to the stop sign? There's a lot of people that walk in the street now. Uh, there's no sidewalk on the west side of East Avenue. And um, um, currently that area isn't within the grant. Grants are very specific to their limitations, but it is one of those areas that I could look at as it relates to maintenance. Um, there, a yep, I know exactly what you're talking about, the fact that there's no sidewalk and the connections across the street. So. There's, a, there's a pedestrian crossway marked. Yep. And there's no place for people to go. And it's doubly damned because the path up the hill has been blocked. blocked. Yep. Yep, yeah, unfortunately that happened under the paving of East Ave before UVM's wall plan was finalized, so. Can you speak to how you are going to do neighborhood outreach on Mansfield Avenue? Um, so again, um, our first kind of outreach effort um, will be that initial um, neighborhood outreach um, when we finalize some concepts, some alternatives for that traffic coming. We want to go to you guys with some concepts on hand so we can have something to work from. Um, from there, we will hold um, a number. I mean, it's kind of going to be in, 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 your, in your hands. I mean, however, <clears throat> however many, you know, public meetings we need to and to decide to select an alternative. Um, we're, we'll work with the design consultant to narrow down those alternatives and um, it will be left up to the neighborhood to vote on those alternatives at the end of the process and, and select one of those alternatives to move forward with for final design. Um, so that would be happening, you know, more towards, more, more throughout the winter. So over the course of um, the next few months, you'll be will be working closely with the neighborhood too. Could you speak to exactly how you're going to reach out to engage the neighbors? Yep. So we would follow um, the DPW approved communication plan that the council approved uh, about a year and a half ago. It, traffic calming falls into a certain category. I can't speak specifically to which category that is. It could include mailings, it could be social media, it could be door, door flyers, um, but we can get back to you guys on that one, what that is. It will certainly either be mailings or flyers at least to all residents along that corridor plus. Hi. Um, you know what that plus is. Sorry. Hi. Over here. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about the uh, University Heights intersection that's listed on one of the last slides that you showed. Um, we're all from the UVM Student Government Association and we know that that specific intersection is one of the most, if not the most heavily trafficked intersections in the entire state. Um, it is also very unsafe, especially due to the high traffic of students that are constantly walking across it. Um, so I was hoping that you could explain a little bit more about um, what the future plans are for that, specifically to make it safer for pedestrians. Yep, uh, DPW just barely um, commenced this fall a study to review the intersection design. Uh, this is something that UVM requested uh, in our partnership with them. <laughs> We have collected traffic data accounts uh, beginning in mid-September and are meeting with our consultants next week to review what that data looks like. The initial work is to see if we can change some of the signal timing to provide allocation uh, either to pedestrians or more to University Heights 
Um, but one of the, the quick pieces that I found really interesting is that in the peak hour, there's about as many students as there are cars going through that intersection. Uh, and that's just in, within one hour, and we're talking like 1,600 students. Um, so we're going to first okay. start by looking at the signal timing. Um, the next step would be looking at the intersection as a scoping for geometry. Um, once we get through that, then we will likely need to look and pursue funding for any of those implementations. We're going to have a couple more questions. Hi, I'm Sandy Wynn. I live on and work on Mansfield Ave full time. Why do we need traffic calming on Mansfield Ave? Can you please explain to me what the traffic calming um, crisis is on Mansfield? I guess I'm missing it. So in 2015, the neighborhood submitted a traffic calming request to the Department of Public Works. Um, this is in the effort that follows that request. So a number of your neighbors have signed a petition and um, submitted that request a few years ago. We did, um, and we put a stop sign up, which did it. And it was a $150 or $200 stop sign, and it works beautifully. Um, so I guess I'm missing what the big problem is now. Great. And if the neighbors no longer want additional action, one of the things we can do is look at a no-build alternative on the traffic calming piece and focus our efforts on that shared use path. And that could move us on to other traffic calming neighborhoods. Uh, we received a request. We're going to follow through to engage you to understand whether conditions and perspectives have changed. If they've changed, we can move on to other projects. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to have a public meeting. We'll be notifying folks of this request. And if people respond in writing and get the meeting that they don't want traffic calming, then that this is a resident-driven process. If residents don't want traffic calming, we are not going to proceed with it unless it's a request uh, based on another uh, plan or guiding document like plan B to be walk by. Yeah, just, I just would like to clarify on, on that. When we did make the petition for the stop sign, and I, this precedes uh, your time, I think, so Chapin. Can, can but, you have your place? What? Yeah. Can you have your place? Yeah. Can you have your place? Can you have your place? Uh, no, I mean, well, no, it was actually a condition of the DPW commission that we put in a uh, traffic calming petition uh, after we got approval for the stop sign. And then there was supposed to be feedback to the neighborhood about whether the stop sign was actually adequate. So I'm assuming that will be part of, of this process going forward. So, so uh, sir, we're running out of time. We obviously need to have you all come back. And, uh, um, or, or could we have their phone numbers? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Department of Public Works? Sure. Um, it, well, they're, they're I, I know their number, but, but each engineer, I mean. OK. Um, it, we can be reached through the DPW customer service number, the 863-9094. There are six engineers in our group and two transportation planners. We kind of divide up the work. And our customer service can get you to the right and person. And rather than take time now, we'll, we'll get it in the, in the meeting summary, OK? Um, so um, but. And Lisa, if you could come up, that would be great. And as she comes up, I just want to say that um, I'm going to speak for myself as, rather than as a facilitator here. I'm really disappointed in, in what we heard tonight because uh, earlier this year, this beginning of the summer, we'd heard from DPW that they, were, they had a chunk of money to address trip and hazard issues this summer. And uh, we didn't hear about that now. It's, it's October, obviously. It, nothing's going to happen in terms of the, the, the very dangerous such stretches of sidewalk that we have all over the city, and particularly in uh, the Hill section, I think. And uh, um, I think we're going to have to ask you to come back to, to really get a commitment that next year uh, those things get addressed because it's dangerous. People are getting hurt. There are at least three people in this room that have had four that have had um, serious falls just in the last few months, and we need you guys to do something about it. You're our servants. Please hear us. Absolutely. We okay. listed a number of those on the PowerPoint tonight, and we'll come with our 2020 plan next month uh, or the month after because uh, we don't have that finished. Just check it, highlight, yeah. highlight them in the presentation that we post on our website. Okay. okay. Just highlight That'd be great. Them, put them in the red. And, and okay. get them fixed, please. So um, next up is Lisa. I'd ask you to, uh, Jonathan, can you help with that? And then she can, yes. yeah. Oh, there it is. Ah. You got it. 
So this is Lisa Kingsbury uh, from UVM, and uh, she was, uh, was going to speak to uh, baseline information about housing, student housing, uh, and, uh, because obviously that affects uh, um, the citywide housing. She's also going to speak to salt shed permitting, if she can get her presentation up. But Jonathan, maybe could you step in and, and you could spe start yeah, speaking? Just moving slowly, I think. Okay, if you want to just start talking. Yeah, there, I'll start talking. Um, so hi, I'm Lisa Kingsbury. I'm with uh, UVM, and uh, I said earlier, it's Campus Planning Services. It's actually planning, design, and construction. We just mo merged with another department. Um, but I'm here to talk about two projects. One is the addition of some salt sheds behind um, Centennial Field, which will make more sense when I have the plan. And then the NPA asked me to come and give some statistics on fall enrollment. Um, so let me just ex start explaining the salt shed plan before um, we get the maps up. So physical plant has a maintenance area. It's been there for many, many years. It's behind Centennial Field, located, um, let's see if I'm getting my directions correct, uh, east of the Velco substation, south of Centennial Field, and then north of where our stormwater pond is. And we have um, lots of materials that are stored there, one of which is salt to keep our campus safe in the winter. So we currently have one salt shed in that area. Um, this project is about improving safety on campus because it does not hold enough salt to get us anywhere near to, um, close to through the winter. So we have to refill it several times and I guess the last couple of winters physical plant has run into some issues um, with being in danger of not being able to get enough salt towards the end of the winter because the suppliers were running out and the municipalities get priority. Um, so they would like to install two new salt sheds um, and some other associated improvements and this project is on the DRB agenda for next week. Still not coming up, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, um, okay, so it's, um, okay, so as I said, adding the second salt shed is just gonna give us reassurance that we'll be able to stockpile enough salt that will help us maintain a steady supply through the winter to make sure that our roads and our sidewalks are safe for everybody who um, lives and works um, or visits our campus. Um, there's a couple of other little associated projects with this. Um, there's a dilapidated, actually two dilapidated sheds that we'd like to replace in the same location with one new shed. Um, there's some brine tank. There's a brine tank. We'd like to add another brine tank. Yeah. So in the interest of time, if we could move on to the housing, the baseline housing information that we requested, that would be great. Because I don't, um, unless that people want to hear more about the like brine sheds. No, I, th yeah. I think people Finish are really interested in Finish a little bit explaining the project so people know what it is. Um, oh, I think we'd. <laughs> Yep, so I wanted to get to the trucks. Yep, I wanted to get to the trucks because I know that was a question as well. So um, the question is how big are the trucks and how often they're going to come. And so the trucks are 25 ton, uh, generally 25 ton tandem dunk, dump trucks. Those go there now to fill the salt sheds and they go several times a winter. Um, that would be the same with maybe an occasional lar larger truck. Um, and then other than the initial filling of the two new sheds, this, wouldn't, this won't increase truck traffic at all. There still will be times where deliveries will be coming in over the winter because physical plant wants to make sure that they can maintain enough salt to get through. So probably towards the end of the winter that it won't happen as often, but there shouldn't be any increase in what's happening now there. Um, maybe a slight increase towards the end of winter when they feel like we're gonna, we're gonna make it through without any issues. Um, there were some questions about delivery hours, and those hours happen during f generally during physical plant um, working hours, which are seven, seven o'clock, seven a.m. to 3.30 p.m. I do want to just give the caveat that if there's an emergency situation, there could be a time where we have to have a delivery outside of those hours. But generally, um, it is within those hours. And that's what we request of our but deliverers. Does anybody have any other questions about the salt sheds? No. If you're staying, Nancy, I can show you, okay. I can show you the map. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, we had asked for some baseline information about housing. It's now nine o'clock or a minute to. Um, are you? If are are people interested enough to stay for another ten or fifteen minutes? I'm seeing some nods. If you need to leave, if you need to leave, we understand that. Uh, so don't feel like you're being rude. Um, yeah, I understand that people have plans, but this is really important information to begin the conversation about housing um, at UVM and how that relates to housing in Burlington. So. Um, and unfortunately, we're having trouble with the. So sorry. It worked on my computer before I, right before I left. It was. I, I checked it. It was running fine. I'm sorry. I guess that this disk do you, just doesn't like this computer. Do you have the numbers that you could just? I have the numbers. I can rattle them off. Um, so the NPA asked me to come and answer a few questions and give a snapshot of our fall enrollment and housing. Um, so I did want to give a quick update because I know people are getting anxious to hear about the results of the housing master plan. So I wanted to let you all know that we did have our consultant on campus a couple of weeks ago. He's given us a lot of information that we are now in the process of digesting internally, want to make sure we can get to our new president, um, and we are still committed to bringing that information back to the NPA when it's ready. Um, so this fall, uh, we had a slight uptick in our undergraduate population that was planned, um, projected in last year's projections. I, every year I come and show, and um, so uh, up by just about 100 students, um, undergraduate students this year. Um, the current five-year projection now is that we will remain stable um, in enrollment, and certainly with the lower number of students that are graduating high school um, in the Northeast and, and nationally. We certainly hope that we're able to maintain that um, stability and with the issues that some other colleges are having, we're really hoping. That that enrollment, though. Do you have that number? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, 10,535 uh, 10, students. Thank you. You're That's welcome. Undergrad, That's undergrad. So for graduate students, um, we have 1,600 graduate students and 475 medical students. Um, housing capacity is essentially the same for this year. Uh, we have 6,411 beds on campus. That includes both beds within the Res Life system and with our affiliated housing like Redstone Lofts, Redstone Apartments. Um, we have a lease for a few beds. It's uh, about 23 beds, I think it is, at Spinner Place um, this year. And we include those numbers in there as well. Um, let's see. If you could see the chart, you, could, you would see that we are, even though the enrollment has gone up a little bit, the housing capacity has also gone up. So we always go back to that housing agreement that we signed in 2009 that was referenced earlier and was renewed this year for one more year. Um, and we are still, uh, that agreement had, um, part of that agreement is that we would add beds on a one-to-one -one basis with any increase in enrollment. So we are about 325 beds um, more than we would need just to fulfill the terms of that agreement at this point in time. So we've kept up with the increase in enrollment since 2009. Um, and there was a question about housing costs, which I brought some of, but I don't know how much we want to get into that. I have a spreadsheet um, on housing costs. Those are all on the university's re residential life uh, website. And there are, what, what are the there are 11 different room types. So I, could, I brought a sample of them that I was going to show you tonight. Um, and I'm happy, to I'm happy to give you that link so yeah, people can look could it you, up. If you could share, share what you uh, send that to, to Jonathan, yep, and I Jonathan will get it on our, uh, the NPA website. Yep, no uh, that would be great. Yep, yeah. Yeah. So we want to have to go The range, around. okay, so if we're looking at a cost per year, the, for an entire year, um, the most expensive house, uh, most expensive housing is a private single, and that is one person in one room with a private bathroom. And that housing cost is $10,624 a year. And the least expensive is a quad, and that's four people in a room with a, a common bathroom in the hallway. That's um, $5,700 per year. And that's a per academic year? Uh, per academic year. Our, our most um, common room type is a traditional double. So what probably most of us had when we went to college, two people in a room and bathroom, uh, common bathroom in the hallway, that's $8,502 per year. I'm sorry? How many months? Uh, that's, it's a, um, nine months, so two semesters. Thank you. So they have to move out in the summer? 
Yes. What, because um, my understanding, can you just explain what costs are going into establishing that, that price range other than just the space in the bathroom because it's res life, all those other services, utilities, are those yeah, also wrapped yeah. into it? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we talk about, and I had actually broken these down um, by monthly costs as well, so people could kind of compare with what they know the market rate to be. If you look at a monthly cost, it's pretty close to what the market rate is for um, housing downtown. It's not in a total apples to apples, to apples comparison because you know, what you get when you're on campus is a little different than if you're in a house. So you get all of your utilities are paid for, your internet is paid for, um, you have security, there are staff, we have staff that are in the residence halls. So there are costs associated with that that go into um, living on campus. I think when possible this including everything yep. that, that in a list. so you can, yep. we can make a better comparison. Thank you. Yep. How many of the beds are filled that you have? How many are filled? Um, so Over 100%. we actually, so when we report numbers, um, we try to be consistent. Um, so, you know, anytime you look at data, it's going to change in terms of what day you look at it and what you're looking at. So when I give you the number of 6,411 beds, that is actually, it's the design capacity of our residence halls and it's what we report on to be consistent. Every year that fluctuates a little bit because ResLife will make adjustments depending on how many students are coming. So um, that number this year of actual students housed in the fall, I brought it. Um, it it's higher. It's actually, it's actually a little bit more. What, what, um, what number is higher? So it's about 5,800. What, what, what's 5,800? What's the number? Is, is the number that we're housing right, right now in the fall. The number of housing units? No, well, no. <laughs> I know this is a little confusing, and this is why we don't usually <laughs> change what we're reporting on. So, if you were going to say how, how, what's the occupancy rate is usually what people are asking, it's over 100% because we've, we've added in some beds. Sometimes we may convert a lounge, or you may have a large single that you turn into a double. So, in the numbers that I report, again, just to be consistent, um, because these confusions do get confusing, that single that may have two people in it this year, in my reporting, I'm only counting it as a single. But you're saying that every, right. every residential room is occupied, is that what you're saying? Right now, yeah. Every single one, yeah, okay. Um, other questions, comments? I know it's late. Um, Thank you. I, I'm confused about, because I feel like the, can't, you know, the school keeps growing and growing, and you tear down buildings, and you build new things and stuff, but it seems like there is a lot more impact in our neighborhoods as far as homes being purchased and turned into student rentals, but you're saying that actually you are housing more people than, but really it's kind of like half, because you're, yeah. there's about 12,000 if you count everybody, and 6,000 are in beds. Right? Yeah. Is that sort of it? Approximately, Approximately. yes. And they're not, okay. and the caveat, obviously, you know, also that I always have to say is they're not all in Burlington. Sure. Particularly the graduate and medical students, they tend to spread out a little bit further. Right. So, yep. Okay. So, huh. I wonder why we're still losing homes. There are investors out there yeah. that don't care. So, other questions? They want to make money. Other questions? So, um, Lisa, if, if you would uh, email that. Uh, the materials that yep. we couldn't bring up, and that. we'll get that on, on the NPA website. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch in terms of when the housing study is ready to, yes. Yes, and I apologize again for the presentation not working. Great, and we look forward to talking with your president next yes. month. Yes, right. good. Um, anything else before we wrap up? Um, if you've completed the survey, drop it off right here in the corner because uh, you'll make Jonathan very, very, very happy. And uh, um, if you want to take it with you and email it to one of the steering committee members, that'd be great. Thanks for coming. Bye.